Welcome back, everyone, to the Shock Absorber podcast. It is fantastic to have you along with us, whether you are listening or paying attention with your eyeballs as well on YouTube or you're just listening on your favourite podcast app. I am here with my two regular co-hosts, as usual. Tim, how are you? Oh, I'm doing very well, thank you, Joe. Excellent. And Stu, how are you? Good, thanks, mate. Yes. How are you feeling? Good. Yeah? Bit sick yesterday. Bit sick. I've had a stuffed nose since last Friday. Yeah, that's what it's, I had la- yesterday. It's weird. It just mm. lasts forever. I don't know. I'm not sick with anything else. That's all I had. Mm. Bit, I was a bit tired though. Yeah. I'm fine. I'm peachy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that, that, that'll do it for the shock Peachy. Yeah, I'm I peachy. like that. Peachy. peachy. Very peachy. Peachy. Yeah. Every time someone says that, I think of the Mario Kart character, Peach. Oh, yeah. Mm. Anyway. I think of the 90s song, Peaches. Oh, Peaches by the president, president of the United States. Mm. Mm. That is a good, a good song. Mm. Good do yourself a favour. Look it up. It's good. Yep. Look that up. Anyway, <laughs> from one cultural artifact to another. <laughs> Sorry, from one, uh, we talk about movies and shows and stuff like that. And uh, one of the things that we're going to start this episode with is a show called Rogue Heroes, which is available. I've been watching on SBS on demand, and uh, Stu and I, you've, you've, Stu and has been watching it as well, and uh, it's quite interesting. Uh, and I thought it kind of applies to what we're talking about today as well. Um, but if you haven't listened to it and Stu or watched it, Stu, you correct me if I get anything wrong here, but it's a kind of about the establishment of the SAS, which is a special air service in the British Royal Army, I think. Did I get that right? You're always a bit of an Anglophile, so you <laughs> you, get, you always correct me on those things which you need to. Um, but what they do is that they track how the SAS established itself and it was basically a guy within the British Army when they were in Cairo in the, the North African front. Um, and the Germans were making a lot of progress across that uh, northern coast of Africa, and he was a bit sick of how the, his generals were not doing anything about it in that particular theatre of war, and he said, I'm going to change it. So he decided, him and he had a friend, they get together, and they basically say, we're going to start a parachute infant, <laughs> parachute regiment. <laughs> and I don't know, like, watching the show, there's six episodes that have come out so far, and there's still more to come. It's a BBC show, so I think they're actually coming out as we speak, or at, during during this particular time. And uh, they say, yeah, we're going to start a parachute regiment. What do we need? Well, we need, a pl- we need to steal a plane. <laughs> and so they, st- they, st- they st- go to steal a plane, and they say, well, what are you going to hook your parachutes up to? And they're like, we don't know, because that's what the parachutists did at the time. They would hook up to the top line and then just jump out of planes and would open up their parachute. And he said, they go, oh, we'll just tie it to one of the seats. <laughs> and then they jump out. And then the main character, David Sterling, um, ends up injuring himself because it rips his doing that rips his parachute and he ends up landing quite heavily and having a spinal contusion now there's all they do say at the start of every episode that these are the based on real events but it doesn't mean everything happened so we should be (laughs) or should be careful of basing everything as truth um for what that shows um talking about but Stu, what are your impressions of the show as well yeah i think they they decided that they'd uh They'd sort of, even though, like you said, they were throwing stuff together and hobbling it all together, they were trying to do something that was a bit more effective than what they thought the rest of the army was doing. Mm. And, uh, yeah, I think their their main modus operandi was to operate behind enemy lines and to try and get there. That's why they wanted the parachutes. But I think they end up getting the trucks, don't they, and the jeeps and going over long distances over... They set up a base. Behind, yeah, they set up a base somewhere and then they attack the airfields and supply depots and I think that just and disrupt things from behind. Yeah. And I think one of the reasons was because the German general Rommel, they realised that, and this again was what they said on the show, but the three, it's usually they say you don't want to go more than 300 kilometres from the your supplies have to travel that far. And they were mm-hmm. saying that it was upwards of 500 kilometres. So they thought this is a real opportunity to attack the supply lines and, yeah, and yeah. the aircraft and yeah, things like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Pretty crazy. Pretty seen, brave. Yeah, there's quite a few things going on in there. There's quite a few crazy characters. Like the, the whole idea is to quite find a bunch of crazy characters that are willing to push the boundaries of how you operate within a a, a particular regiment or a particular um, uh, military group. And uh, they actually they go with no nickname. And they're, 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 the, the way that they actually adopted the name Special Air Service was apparently there was a, an, an espionage officer who had decided he was going to create a pretend special air service to, to mislead the German and the Italian armies. And then they ended up going, well, we might just do this. <laughs> when, once, it, once they were successful on a few missions, they're like, well, we may as well just call just it the special air this. service. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it's, uh, it's quite an enjoyable uh, 
show. I enjoy, obviously, uh, anything related to World War Two. It's really interesting, but it's cool how they go. Also, they break. They want to break the rules and the conventions of what you're meant to do in in the military. Mm-hmm. And one of the things is ask questions a lot. That's interesting. They're like, don't just do what the, your commanding officer say. If a commanding officer says, this is what we're going to do, one thing that you – and they, they're actually planning out a mission is like, why is no one asking questions? Um, and that was a thing they were saying that that wasn't really happening at the time of the – one of the things they wanted to push against was the, the lack of – actually questioning why are we doing this so the men would understand why they were going to such difficult scenarios. Um, and they also have very little commanding officers. That was the other idea. It was like you're just – you're picked for a reason. You're going to be really good at your job, so we're going to trust you to be able to do it. So it lends itself to a lot of things we're going to talk about, which is what we also talked about last week. And, Tim, I love you. you um, this morning you mentioned something you want to kick off this particular episode with, but last episode we talked about professionalism and said that's something we should look at. Mm. You know, as one episode, what was your thoughts about professionalism and what did you want to share with us? Yeah, as we were uh, recording last week and um, just thinking more about it over the week, one of the things that came to mind was a conversation I had a few months ago with um, a friend in ministry about the changes that had happened in the Anglican Church in Sydney, uh, particularly um, from the 70s to the 80s uh, was a particular time frame. And... If you went to any Anglican church in Sydney in the 70s, this is how you're telling the story, um, would essentially look the same. So the buildings, um, well, the variety of buildings depending on when they were built, but out the front there was a plaque that was often sky blue with a Southern Cross uh, and that was just the branding and every Anglican church had that branding as part of it. You go inside and every service was an Australian prayer book service. It followed the set liturgy depending on the week you're in. And really the only difference from church to church was the rector, the senior minister, who would, you know, their personality would be infused in the way that they led the liturgy. Their sermons would be obviously um, distinct to them. But otherwise, uh, the intentionally, all the services looked the same. And as we are chatting about this, before Joel said, oh, kind of like McDonald's. And I was like, yeah, yeah that was the idea. It was you, you knew what you were going to get. Um, and you could go to an Ang- Anglican church anywhere in Sydney, and it didn't matter what suburb you were in, uh, and you knew exactly what you were going to get. What happened um, in a shift through the 80s was um, a contextualisation conversation, which was, well, actually, all of the different areas in Sydney are different to each other. And so having church in south is different to west, to northwest, to north, to beaches, to you know, wherever. And so there was a conversation in the Anglican Church, which was how about we actually allow the churches more autonomy to shape uh, everything about them, uh, from the design of the building to the um, uh, messaging out the front, um, to the colours that they use, to the way that they conduct the service, in a way that would contextually minister to the particular parish that they were in. And the idea was if you contextualised your service to your parish, then you would um, hopefully have more success missionally because you'd be able to connect with the people who were in your parish and they would they walk through the doors of their local Anglican church and it would feel a little bit more like they were used to, that they would know... Um, what it was like, uh, and it would f- suit their needs as a, a particular geographic area. And so that was the intention. And as we've often said um, on the, the podcast, and this is, Stu, I've, it's a phrase of you've used for at least 30 years, is there's always shadows to a good thing, mm. uh, and creatures live in the shadows. So one of the shadows of the good intention to contextualise so that you could be more locally helpful was that, it started to create um, a bit of a, almost a competition. Um, And that didn't start out like that, but that was eventually how it ended. And particularly when you've got members of the church that have um, external to church are growing up in a very consumer mindset where you shop for the best, whatever it is, fridge, lounge, TV, whatever. Um, Suddenly that stepped into their thought about churches as well. Before, there wasn't really that much point driving past three Anglican churches to get to the one over there because every one you drove past was exactly the same as the one you were going to. So it 
increased local participation but when churches started to contextualize all of a sudden it's like oh, i actually like what's going on at the church four churches over than i do my local and so you have a highly mobile society in suburbia um, with car use plus this um you know adults who have been growing up in a consumer mentality of you know you shop around for the best thing for you um and then that also drives the church go well we want to do a good job at attracting people um, missionally you want to attract people who are not yet in church but uh, it's very easy to also say well what's going to make our church distinctive to the church down the road which will also be an attractive factor to other christians as well so as all of this is playing out over time again coming from a really wonderful intention and, and place is uh the the thought in my head was that starts to lead in towards this professionalism in that you want the service that you're running uh, really crassly, the product that you're putting out into the Anglican church marketplace, um, also amongst other lots of faithful churches, you know, wonderful Baptist churches, Presbyterian churches, um, etc., that uh, you need to do a really great job of your service so that it's the one that is sticky, that people want to come to and stay and be a part of because that then increases your discipleship, it increases your missional effectiveness, it increases your resources. Um, if people come, they enjoy your church and they stay. And so all of this over time starts to push further and further towards professionalising what is done um, in your church. And you've got to have um, great programs, you've got to have great ministry, you've got to have dynamic people out the front um, because they're the kinds of things that lead people to want to stay. And so I think slowly um uh that that is sort of what's come through and we now just assume that those kind of things are a part of that um so yeah that were my thoughts uh that have sparked yeah my imagination over the last <laughs> last week mm. um and now after having lobbed that i'm actually need to head off and i'm going to uh <laughs> leave you guys a discussion i look forward to hearing <laughs> yeah thanks for throwing in the grenade and we'll, oh, that's we'll right. deal with it <laughs> you can, you can it's very it sas that. of you yeah, that's right <laughs> that's right i'll be the sas i'll just blow it up enemy lines yeah. and um, <laughs> leave you guys to handle the mess yeah it's more friendly fire though from you right. <laughs> <laughs> anyway cool thank you thank you for no thank, thank you it's, it's going to be very interesting well, tim and uh Stu and i will continue the conversation yeah thanks yes. tim <laughs> What is uh, your reaction to that, Stu? Is that you think, I think it's, it's a good growing it's a up good in insight. that? Growing up in that, yeah. As well? well, that's where I was going to go. Like I, I found it interesting when Tim said said this morning that he'd had that conversation because, um, yeah, I think that's what the era I grew up in. So I grew up. I was a primary school in the seventies, mm. high school in the eighties, and I noticed the transients. And I think the transients by the time that the late eighties came along was just something I thought was always there. So it's really interesting to think, actually, there was a time where all the churches looked the same and it occurred to me that, yeah, you probably wouldn't go around looking for another church too mm. much if all the churches were the same. So uh, the fact that we've became more diverse meant that people became more transient was probably an unexpected outcome to that. And uh, funnily enough, that's one of the reasons why we started Soul Revival because things were so transient in our growing up. We wanted to create a bit more continuity for the young people and so... Louise and I de determined to, under God, see if we could stick around to provide a bit of continuity because people were moving around so much. But that wasn't because our church was really good. We didn't have any young adults left at our church at all and we were the only young adults left. So from our point of view, the service was geared to a past time that wasn't as relevant to us even in the 80s and um, you know, we're still singing. I think the, the songs we were singing were more modern, but they weren't as contemporary as the music we were listening to, but they were presented as a youth service and the songs were out of a book called Songs of Praise or something, I think. Mm. I don't know, one of our listeners or watchers might be able to help me with that one, but uh, Songs of Praise were like still singing kind of folky songs from the 70s when we were listening to The Cure and Joy Division and stuff like that. So, right. yeah, we were in a new wave, I think you'd call that, in the early uh, 80s and then later on we're into more alternative stuff and yeah it was very different to what we we're getting mm -hmm. in church so there wasn't really something that we thought was something that we really enjoyed because of the cultural impact it was having on us it was more like 
we really felt convicted to be loyal to our church when we'd seen a lot of people just keep moving around. And you have mentioned that before, like yeah. the, the, the last young adults. And, and, and I, I mean, it's not something that I've experienced, really. There's always been young adults around me yeah, when I've been yeah, in church. Yeah. Did you have the sense at that time that churches were almost competing against each other? Or oh, was very it more much. Yeah. 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 So we lived in a suburb in south of Sydney called Gaimi. And within Gaimi, there was a Gaimi Anglican church and a Gaimi Baptist church. And there were probably some other ones as well. But the Gaimi Anglican church was the smaller cousin to the big Gaimi Baptist, which was like a regional church in the area. So a lot of our young people that grew up just went to Gaimi Baptist church as a matter of course. Mm-hmm. So I think uh, I remember thinking that when there was a cool model of, or approach that set up, people would move to that and you'd watch people move around from church mm-hmm. to church. Uh, in in my lighter moments, I've sometimes described the Sutherland Shire where we live as like the Christians in the Shire are, are moving around like a big herd of wildebeest, like sort of grazing on the plains. And it's the impact's been that a lot of people in the Shire know each other because they've been to church with each other somewhere along the line in all those churches. But at the same time as that, I mean, it wasn't all a, a negative thing. I think I think there's actually partly a good impulse from churches trying to do things well, seeing other churches do things well and thinking, yeah, it is a good thing to try and do things well so when we talk about professionalism we're not necessarily despising doing things well but i think what negative parts we have picked up on are things like transience consumerism mm. stuff like that i was going to ask you though uh, well, i mean you would, you're doing a good job of pulling it back to being positive about it too but i was going to ask you what do you think the things like the consumerism and transience how did that affect people's kind of walk with jesus and the, and then the discipleship and mission affecting us yeah i i I've shared on the podcast before, I had an elder a mentor called Dudley Ford in the 1990s and he and I talked about this early on and I can't remember if I raised it with him or if he raised it with me, but Dudley said to me once that he was concerned about the fact that it seemed to him at the time in the 90s that people seemed to move house on average once every 10 years or so, something like that. And he's like, every time someone moves house, they move church. And he said he was thinking from the North Shore where he was living that maybe people were moving even more regularly than that. Like maybe it was once every five years. And he's, he was, his point to me was, well, if people move house and move to a different place once every five years and they do move churches when they move house, then that means people are constantly moving um, churches. And his fear was that maybe that, well, his, his theory was that Christians need about five years to really start to connecting with each other mm-hmm. before they start really carrying one another's burdens and really learning how to encourage one another and going beyond that sort of surface relationship, you know, oh, how are you going? How was your week? Good, how was your week? But to actually live life together and uh, do that in the church is um, something that takes time. So he, he was lamenting that one of the shadows of professionalism and, and you know, churches doing things differently was that people were moving around and maybe – not having a consistency in their discipleship. And that was definitely my experience in the 80s. Every every two years or so, we'd have a new minister come and we'd all get to know the minister, but then they'd move on to the next church. And then when the minister moved on, often the youth leaders and the leaders who that minister had rallied together often said, oh, I've done my bit now, now it's time for someone else to do it. So oh, yeah. there was this constant turnover, maybe maybe two years is an exaggeration, I might have been three or five years, but there wasn't this opportunity to really connect and there was this feeling amongst us, don't get too close to the minister because they're just going to go anyway. And then I remember that turning into, maybe don't get too close to all the other people at church because they'll probably yeah, move yeah. on as well. Yeah. So there was a bit of that. There was a little bit of a disconnect with our discipleship and it's hard to learn how to read the Bible for yourself if you don't have someone walk through that with you and it's hard to learn how to live your life as a Christian if you don't have someone to live that out. Now, the church was thinking the whole time, well, if the event is run professionally, then those discipleship outcomes will take place. But I think maybe just because you have a youth group or just because you have a really professional church service doesn't necessarily mean that we're all growing in our, in our, uh, in, in our, in our faith and being discipled. Mm. Is, would you say that uh, a focus, the focus on continuity and, and I'm someone that's um, has experienced that too and, and really gained a lot of value from that, especially when we had our leaders go through all of youth group with mm. us. That's just one example of it. Do you think that um, 
if there's a, if there's people looking for professionalism, do you think the continuity kind of bridges that gap in case that it's, say that people are looking for professionalism, but when they find that there's actually continuity, they're, they're actually that's what they're actually looking for, rather than the professionalism may be appealing, but it's not. Um, it's maybe surface level, like those relationships we were talking about, and the continuity again is the kind of uh, what's the right word, kind of um, hedges against that in a certain mm. way. Do you think that would have been that that was your experience? Yeah, I'll have a think about how they're related. I, I mean, my experience was the church was trying to employ really good people to teach well mm. and to disciple, and they were they were really loving people. They really loved us, and they worked really hard amongst us. And then as they moved on, that wasn't an unhealthy thing because it's important that the church keeps sending people out. So I'm not saying that there shouldn't be any moving out, but I think there might be some kind of need for a critical mass of people who are sticking around as well as people who who move out. And I think that professionalism is something that's kind of been a movement across our whole society and I think the church is also talking about that um, we talked about the 70s when I was young um, over in America in the 1970s the church growth movement started out and the idea of the homogeneous unit principle mm. was starting to emerge so at the same time churches were talking about having different expressions there were churches that were still emerging out of what had been a traditional expression of church where in the 1960s they were still using prayer books that were written 400 years ago and then in the 1970s a new prayer book came out I think 1978 I can't remember but it was a, an attempt to sort of I suppose modernize the church liturgy to make it more uh, easily relatable to modern Australia and still theologically correct but so you've got this kind of impulse of let's you know give churches freedom to do things a bit differently at the same time as let's not all just be traditional churches. So in America, the thing that tied those two impulses together in my mind was the church growth movement that said it's really good to do traditional services well if you're going to do traditional service. But it's also really good to identify that young families need a contemporary family service and young people need a contemporary youth service. So let's see if we can get a church big enough to have maybe at least three expressions, one for the youth on Sunday night, one for the young families on Sunday morning and the traditional service as well. So you've kind of got these three different groups within the church meeting. And then as you got older and you were too old to go to the morning fam contemporary family service as a kid, you were encouraged to leave that service, leave your discipleship and go and get discipleship by a new group of people on the evening service. And then I think the idea was that those people would all pair up and have kids and then come back to the family service. I think that was the idea of it. But there's a kind of inbuilt transience in that model as well. But the focus wasn't so much on the quality of the relationships, although that was assumed that there'd be good quality relationships that people would have with Jesus and with each other. But there was this idea that you would have relationships with other people who were like you that would give you good quality relationships. And let's create a context for those relationships that is really age specific. So there's a, a focus on having really good quality music, having good quality preaching, having a really tight service. I remember a lot of adults at the time were saying that they wanted the church to be as professional as where, where they'd have other things in their life too. So the parking need to be really good and clean and the building was presentable. All those things were part of the distinctive that would actually help Australians to go, yeah, I can connect with this. Because I remember a time when people used to say, the church is really out of date, the church is really daggy, the church is a bit hokey, I think it was the, I don't know what that word means or where it comes from, but I remember hearing people use that, mm -hmm. that the church is sort of like semi-professional, trying to have a go. I remember business people saying to our ministers, hey, you need to do this more professionally, like in business we would do it like this, in business we would take this more seriously. So I think there was this equating of if we do it well, we're actually um, doing it well for giving Jesus. God, yeah, yeah, we're doing God, giving God our all, which was yeah. fine. But uh, in, in the early 90s, uh, another church became really prominent in Sydney with this kind of movement called Willow Creek, and they just had a huge explosion in the 70s and 80s and become one of the biggest mega churches in America, led by Bill Hybels. And he wrote a number of books and was a big fan. Uh, there's a lot of fans of his in Sydney. And I went along to a conference. I didn't even know who he was, but I went there and I think there was probably 20,000 people there. And most of them were Anglicans. It was a huge number of Anglicans. And their whole take on things was 
to say you need to pre- present a really professional service for Christians midweek and a really professional seeker service, they called it, for non-Christians on the weekend. So they took this homogeneous unit principle to another level and said, don't just do services for different age groups, but do a service for Christians and then one for non-Christians. Right. And the whole thing you need to do is make the gospel really easy to understand and relevant for people and do it in a really professional way with with media and you know drama and and really really good music and a lot of people left that conference in the early 90s thinking that seeker service was the way to go but it seemed to me that the more people tried to be super professional i was thinking to myself back then no matter how professional we get we're never going to be as professional as the world and i remember thinking what's the point in trying to compete with the world where they're always going to have more money they're always going to be better than us they're going to have better music they're going to have better everything else and uh yeah i think that what we tended to think about is going the opposite direction and thought why don't we really lean into the fact that having a relationship with jesus uh, gives us a relationship with god so jesus laid down his life to pay the price for our sin which is the only barrier between us and god so we're now reconciled to god through jesus's death and resurrection but we're also reconciled to one another and so i feel in my experience in the 80s and 90s i felt relationships kind of came a bit second to the production of the event and so what was supposed to help us to become really deep christians and get other people to come along and hear about it the seekers they called them was meaning that you know i grew up with 40 friends at church and all of them left our church by the end of the 80s and so i kind of thought you can't just take relationships for granted. We are reconciled with one another, but we need to do the best we can to express those reconciled relationships in the church. And we lent into some, what ended up becoming more of a countercultural vibe rather than, I mean, we always tried to do things well, but we weren't trying to be professional anymore. We actually thought, why don't we try and make relationships a really important part of our life together? So, that was a really interesting conversation around that whole idea of professionalism. I wanted to ask you about then you brought it up earlier was that what do you think there was the behind the societal impulse for things to become more and more professional? Like was it as technology improved and you could use I don't know typewriters and yeah. then your computers and then that kind of thing and we, we you didn't I didn't communicate with you writing for example we worked together yeah. and I would type a letter for you yeah, and yeah. all those kind of things. Yeah. And, I'm, and the reason I'm asking is like, I wonder what that's become now. Because even mm. then, even this in the 90s, that's 30 years ago, mm. <laughs> have, have, has society continued to look for highly professional things or has it come back a little bit as a reaction to that? Yeah, well, I think the big answer to that is goes a long way back. It actually goes to the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. So for, I don't know, for 1,700 years, people in Europe, for example, used to basically 75% of people basically lived on farms and in Mm. farming communities and most of the production that took place in in those countries took place within cottage industries so you know you'd have a a local person who was the Uh, what's the guy that does the boots Um, yeah the I forget the name of it. Cobbler. Yeah, cobbler. cobbler. So yeah, you yeah, yeah. have a cobbler and then he'd pass on to his son being a cobbler and he'd mm. pass on to his son being a cobbler. You know, and you have the blacksmith. And, you have the, and there was, uh, you know, women who were incredibly gifted at weaving and could weave all sorts of amazing clothes and stuff. And all that took place in all the different villages. And there was a, a real grassroots approach to life. Now, when the Industrial Revolution took place, someone invented a steam engine. His name was Stevenson. And he made this engine that could then replace people on the farms and create big factory machines and fast transport over vast distances with these steam engine powered trains and so that created this new impulse towards technical innovation Mm. and so the majority of people in europe migrated from the villages to the cities and now uh, only after a couple of decades they had 75% 75% of people were living in cities and 25% of people living in... Because all the jobs in the farmlands dried up and all the cities were burgeoning. So then then there's this big industrialization taking place and everything's about efficiency. And efficiency and productivity become really important because on the farms, like obviously people were interested in productivity, but there wasn't any innovation. Like People were using the same kind of tools they were using in the Roman Empire in 1700s. Yeah. But then 20 years later, it was almost like people were living 
more like uh, they do today um, with with uh, technological advances to replace some of those old-fashioned tools sort of things. So people's over time, people stop riding in horse and buggies and over time they're driving cars and trucks and blah, blah, blah. So we're constantly innovating and we're looking for efficiency all the time. So a good example of that is the Ford motor car. The reason the Ford motor car became so successful is Ford, the man that invented this mm. car and the production technique to produce it the car wasn't so much the big thing but the way he produced it was so he created not only a factory but a production, production line, line right? yeah. and then the production line was you you just sit there and make fenders all day yeah. you sit there and make steering wheels all day and you put the fenders and the steering wheels and the other bits and pieces together at the end and there's the car and it was a lot more efficient mm. and i think we've we've got that happening we've also got scientific research and scientific outcomes in our communities exploding with technological advancements. And so we tend to see a change in where is the valuable wisdom. So in the in the villages, old wisdom was more valuable than new wisdom because tradition was more, more valuable than new crazy ideas that people might come up with. In fact, new ideas were dangerous because if you didn't do the things that people had always done, then you might die. Right. So if you didn't plant, if you, you were crazy and went, hey, let's plant a month early. <laughs> let's plant this crop <laughs> on the top of a mountain instead of on the nice soil. <laughs> hey, what, what have we got to lose? Oh, we'll probably starve to death during yeah. winter because there yeah. won't be and any And other crop. people will too. Yeah, so there was a real distrust for new ideas because people were like, oh, here's a crazy guy. Oh, mm. This is a dangerous idea. But with technological advancement old ideas aren't as valuable as new ideas mm. so now what we need to do is we need to go to the experts who know what the new idea is rather than to the old sages and the old mentors who knew knew the ideas so so now we're professionalizing a lot of things so our hospitals are getting better and instead of just having the neighborhood people who were really caring and knew some herbs or whatever now we've got nurses and doctors and we trust them more than these people mm. with their herbs and so we go to them and that's right across the board education's like that with teachers we've got um people who become uh professional soldiers even professional soldiers weren't even around uh before then they were actually just you'd collect a whole heap of local people and go off to war. But now you're yeah. going to say, okay, in fact, the French were the ones who invented the professional war machines that unfortunately we have to this day, the big mass killing machines where they got all these people together and made professional soldiers and this, that and the other. So professionalism has become the standard. New ideas need experts and the experts are the ones we need to tell us what the new ideas are. So now what we've got in the church is we've got this crossroads because – the church is like based on old ideas and tradition. So the old ideas of the Bible are very old. So it's clashing with a lot of the new cultural ideas. And so there's that tension going on. And the second tension that's going on is the church on the surface still looks like a cottage industry. You've got one minister with a group of people on a parish council in an Anglican church and they get together once a month and they talk about how they could you know, change the curtains and maybe get a better vacuum cleaner or whatever it might be and so understandably there are modern professionals who are like looking into that old way of doing things with that old structure which is a medieval structure in the anglican church not so much in the baptist and other churches but where they became more democratic but the anglican church is still quite medieval so here's this institution that continues on throughout that that whole time and and so there's this tension of well how how do we you know, and the tension came to breaking point after the Second World War, particularly in the 60s, when a whole generation started really reducing, sorry, really reacting against tradition and saying that they want to create a new world. So I think the church's answer was, well, let's move with the times. Let's try and be more professional, hold on to this ancient message, but maybe let's deliver it in modern ways. And so you have... Uh, new music being brought into the youth service to start off with in the evening service and then to the contemporary family service. Then you have um, uh, the Bible study movement starting in the 70s, which was to say, you know, let's get more serious about how we're teaching the Bible to our people midweek as well, which was a good innovation. That's really good. And so it was the music. That was a really good thing. But with the music comes this big argument in the church of, well, it's actually more professional to have drums and guitars because that's what people see within popular culture and less professional to have an organ with a per, one person playing it. So let, so you've got this, this, maybe if we deliver the message in a new professional way and keep the message, 
that's maybe what I saw as a tension in the 70s and 80s. That's what people were trying to do. Uh, there was there was an attempt to take away some of the the traditions that weren't as relevant and weren't as helpful. Uh, there were people saying, do we really need our ministers to be robed anymore and wearing collars and walking around like medieval clerics in 1970? Or is it okay for people just to wear the clothes that other people wear? And to start off with that, robes was replaced by suits and ties and then over time it just got replaced by a collared shirt but there was this idea that the minister went from being a very traditional figure who was robed appropriately with this um almost you know catholic monastic sort of medieval gear that that again had been around for a thousand years but now this new professionalism is the the minister almost becomes the CEO of the church and let's run the church like a business really effectively. I think that was sort of a, that's a bit of a straw man I've created there, but it's sort of a brief description of what I think happened in that move to professionalism. And do you see that, that was really fascinating by the way, thank you for that, but the, I didn't want to skip along without recognising that you really articulated that really well. That kind of, um, I wouldn't say a battle, but a tension maybe that between innovation versus tradition do you think that's mainly that culture is changing so church is grappling with changing culture or is it people coming in from the secular world when they come to church and saying we need to make it more like the world? Yeah, I think I think the impulse from what I experienced mm. and my experience was only limited but what I've also, I suppose, talked to people about and heard their experiences was there's an impulse coming from the church to modernise, not so much people coming into the church to modernise the church. Mm. Uh, I think the baby boomer generation really led that charge mm. and that baby boomer generation were the ones that set up the homogeneous unit principle. They set up the youth service, the family service and the traditional service. They're the ones who started to talk about professionalism, that uh, Bill Hybels from Willow Creek. Uh, Bill Hybels has subsequently been discredited from some of his personal failings but during the 90s he was a bit of a rock star amongst the baby boomer generation for taking a youth group and turning it into a mega church which is basically mm-hmm. what he did and he said that he did that th- that success came through this professionalization of church and making it more targeted to the market and I think if you look at it that way professionalism is also a very capitalist kind of impulse that there's there's a market driven element to this that we need to market the church to the world better by having a more professional product that we can present to the world. Uh, I remember in the 1980s is when branded clothing first started coming in, in my experience, like people started wearing surf clothes that had Billabong on them or had Quicksilver or whatever the brand might be. And all of a sudden at school, you couldn't go to school with a t-shirt on anymore. You had to have a Billabong t-shirt on. If you didn't, you weren't accepted. And that was at the same time that marketing was really taking off i think the church was trying to do its own version of it so that's sort of how i saw that Mm. what do you think it looks like now uh because you you mentioned the 80s and 90s there and i think that i think the innovation thing is still continuing like we even talked about ai a a few episodes ago like that's definitely happening i was was listening to a podcast um the rule of life podcast which is john mark comer and he's talking about things like sabbath and peace and and those kind of things are being very traditional things Mm. which is quite interesting and he said there was a view almost that the continual pursuit of innovation and things like computers and how we communicate with each other would actually give us more leisure time. But what it's ended up doing is actually just creating more, in a sense, menial work that we're just sending more emails between each other rather than going over to talk to them. It's the same same kind of thing. So I thought that was interesting that that might be an indication of where things have gone. And then AI is another step on that. It's yeah. like, oh, it will save us all time, but will it actually save us time? Yeah. Like we'll just fill it with other things. Yeah. What do you think it is? What do you think of some of the tensions would be in church now mm. in terms of that battle between innovation and uh, tradition that we're, we're, we're kind of discussing. Yeah, well, I think there's a real turning point in the early 2000s with 9-11 when the two towers came down. I think that was the, the time when new atheism started up and Christians stopped being the old-fashioned, out-of-date, daggy people yeah, right. and they started becoming the followers of a God that we could be angry at and that was was um, that they were dangerous people because they were religious. And I think in the West, uh, Christians also stand for a lot of ideas that people now think are dangerous to, uh, that pe- people are trying to move on from. And so I think that's a thing. I think the internet is spreading these ideas quicker. So that period of time is when the internet really took off. And then when the iPhone came along and social media started, all these ideas have been 
exasperated. So I think the challenge for the church is to be professional is not enough in the kind of the, the same way that people thought it was enough in the 70s and 80s. If we do things more professionally, people aren't necessarily going to come to church because they actually don't like our ideas anymore because we, we're actually at worst considered um, unhelpful and it, sorry, at best considered unhelpful and at worst considered you know dangerous. Now that's not to say there's not some goodwill in the community towards Christians. I think there still is, but but there is a growing element in our community that's a lot more vocal about their objection to Christians and I don't think that's got to a point of persecution. People argue about that and what is persecution and is this, you know, really dangerous times for Christians. I mean, I remember growing up in the 80s and people, you know, not accepting Christian teenagers at our high school because we were were Christians and thinking our ideas were crazy and um, so I think there's always really been opposition for people who take their faith seriously, even amongst nominal mm-hmm. circumstances in Christendom. I think there were still people who re- resented Christians saying, don't drink too much, it's not a good idea to smoke. You know, Some Christians said, don't go dancing. So there was always a bit of tension in society around Christians always being killjoys. But I think that's what led people to go, well, let's really be professional. And if we can do church as well as everyone does it in the world, then they'll, they'll say we're we're good more appealing yeah but i think the the 2000s and onwards has kind of put into bed that idea i don't think people think like that anymore as much uh so now the tension is around i think um what is christianity should christianity move with the times and of course there's that progressive impulse amongst many uh, particularly in the anglican church you see it in the northern hemisphere uh, with the american anglican church canadian scottish uh the the Church of England is having a big debate at the moment about blessing same-sex unions. There's a whole heap of uh, debate around should we move with the times. But I look at that and I think it's kind of a version of saying, well, if we can be more professional, then they'll come to church. If we can have the same values as everyone else, they'll come to church. I, I see a bit of a connection appealing. between... Yep, if we, if we take away all the things that we teach that aren't acceptable to people, yeah. it's like if we you know take all the weeds out of the car park and make the service shorter and have better music then people will come well if we can take away all the the unpopular bits out of the message maybe they'll come but mm. funnily enough and i'm not a left-wing person i actually uh am quite quite a conservative um, person really but uh funnily enough i think there's a communist writer called gramsci who hits this idea on the head in this idea that he came up with in the early 20th century called hegemony mm. and if i could briefly just explain it, it might help us to to answer the question because This guy Gramsci was uh, really keen to see Italy have a communist revolution like Russia did. And so he'd travel around the countryside to the different factories and tell people to rise up against the owners and take over the country. But they were saying no, 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 no. Anyway, they put him in prison. And while he was in prison, he he wrote this prison notebooks thing. And in it, he came up with this theory about why the Italians weren't rising up to overthrow the owners of the factories like the russians did because what he heard from all the different places he went is that the workers didn't want to overthrow the factory because they were thinking to themselves if we work hard enough we'll have a factory one day too okay so the hegemony he called it hegemony was was a lie that was if you worker work really hard you could have a factory one day too when well this he called it a lie uh which was the majority of workers in Italy never owned a factory, but they worked tirelessly hoping that one day if they worked hard enough, they'd get enough money to own a factory as well. And so he called that hegemonic. So the idea was if we fit into this society and work really hard in it, we'll be accepted. But what he said was you're never going to be able to uh, get a factory now. You could argue whether that was right or wrong or not. But the point that I'm making is if you look at that theory, sometimes Christians think to ourselves, if we can be cool enough then we'll be accepted in the society. But we'll never be fully accepted in the society as a Christian because Jesus said, they hated me, they'll hate you too. So there is a bit of a hegemony or a lie that says that if we are cool Christians, then that's the best way to be successful. And and like I said, professionalism is not all bad. But to say if someone thinks that by being professional we'll be accepted by the rest of the society, that's hegemonic. So as Christians, if, we, if we're trying to say, for example, um, there is a good reason to have a Christian surface group. It's good for Christian surfers to go down to the beach and to surf and to be with people on the beach. 
But if we think by being a Christian surfer we're going to be somehow more acceptable to the world than someone who's not a Christian surfer, I think that's where we get it wrong. So if we think because we've got a professional church that that'll be more successful than the church down the road, not necessarily so, because there might be really powerful mission and evangelism, really powerful discipleship happening in a church that doesn't look really professional. And so my thought is rather than trying to be acceptable to the world, what, what Gramsci was arguing was a countercultural approach, which is to be who you are. And so rather than trying to, it, well, he was saying to workers, which again, I don't agree with it in the context he had, but, you know, to be a worker, be a worker, proletariat, raise up, rise up, all that sort of stuff. I'm not a communist, so I don't subscribe to that. But what I think is a principle underlying all that unhelpful stuff is the principle is, I think, we need to understand our identity and not just try and fit our identity into the broader landscape of the community, but be happy to be a significant minority within that broader community that knows who it is and actually lives out with authenticity who they are. And that's more of a countercultural response rather than a professional response. Because I think there's still professional impulses in our time too, which again, I'm not saying are all bad, but uh, there's, there is a lot of call for for example, for ministers to continue to be really efficient, which again, I think is a consequence of industrialization. So, you know, uh, models like the five M's, if people have heard of that, you know, if you get these five ministry areas sorted out, then that will make your church more efficient and it'll work. Now, that could be a really helpful thing for churches. I don't despise that, but we've got to be careful. We don't think that will be the way to get us to success because we're now efficient and industrial will be able to, to live in this industrial world. I was, I was going to ask you the question, what do you think is the antidote to those those kind of issues we're talking about? But then you answered it. And the two things that I wrote down to ask you was uh, countercultural, and you said that already, <laughs> but um, being confident Christians. And I think it's probably a good uh, place to kind of wrap up the episode. But I suppose my final question is, like, how can we encourage uh, leaders of churches and also people within the members of those churches to be confident Christians rather than knowing I have to be almost like a, a chameleon. Like uh, yeah, I'm out in the world, I'm doing yeah. this, but I'm actually a Christian, but I'm going to keep my head down a little bit. But then we also need to make church like what's going on outside of church so that people might be find that appealing. I suppose this, you know, part of the answer is that we don't need to be, it doesn't need to be an appealing consumer product. I think being confident Christians is actually quite, could be what is the most appealing thing. Yeah, well, a couple of seasons ago, we looked at some of the work of Ian Hussey and Ian's response to that kind of idea, I think is really relevant where he says that uh, the Bible will actually help us to understand whether um, some of the things we're doing could be unhelpful or helpful. And so it's not to say that all cultural change and all efficiency is bad. And in fact, a lot of it's really good and helpful. But the Bible also discourages us from certain certain ways of acting so for example if we we think that we're running a youth group because we've got a youth group and we have youth leaders and we're running a program and we advertise it and it's running pretty well it doesn't necessarily mean that discipleship and mission is going to be happening on on the ground so i think the idea is that as we seek to have a christian identity we seek to clothe ourselves with christ as paul says in colossians that we are prepared and happy to be distinctive but distinctive as members of our communities. We speak the same language, we wear the same kind of clothes most of the time. Uh, there's, there's, a, there's a really helpful tool that we have at our disposal, which is the Bible to help us to discern those things one by one, I think. Mm -hmm. And I love it how Jesus says, just live one, each day at a time, like one day at a time. So we can plan for the future and we can organise ourselves, but all our plans and our organisation isn't going to be the, the sole factor in our success. It's actually going to be... Um, partnering with Jesus as he builds his church. Mm, I think that's a really good way to wrap it up. And, and <coughs> we were talking about rogue heroes at the start of the episode and it was kind of like, well, maybe we're not encouraging people to be rogue, but also to yeah. go, no, you can, within the structure, you can say, these are, these are things that might work within our own, our own context. And, yeah. and But we, unlike rogue heroes, we actually have the Bible really pointing us in that direction hopefully yeah, so. yeah well i think the thing about rogue heroes which is interesting is these guys are signed up to join the army not to lounge around in cairo yeah and the army was lounging around in cairo while the enemy was just moving forward and there was fairly inept generals not 
not succeeding on the battlefield until they got Montgomery. They didn't really mm. turn that around, and Adele Alamein they obviously turned it around, and and Montgomery was a big part of that. But what you got is a group of guys who said, "Well, we've we've we haven't signed up for a holiday in Cairo in Egypt. We've signed up to fight." So they just went and did it. Yep. And I think they, <laughs> they had a pretty strong identity as soldiers. They went and they did it, yep. and you know rightly or wrongly so i think that you know the bible does say that we're not civilians you know paul says that we are to be like a farmer and be diligent in in the work of the gospel as a farmer is we'd be like a sports person and train hard and work hard to be an athlete we're also to be like a soldier and not get distracted by civilian things Mm -hmm. so i think the danger of doing things really professionally and doing well is we we can unfortunately the shadow of that is we can create christian consumers who can get a bit distracted by worldly things um, but it's a good thing to keep talking about and working out what that balance is as yeah. we go forward. No, I think so, and I think it's been really uh, another enlightening episode. So thank you very much for your time, and also for Tim who <laughs> lobbed in his uh, hand grenade of a question and then <laughs> left. So, um, but yeah, thank you very much. We'll continue to do that. Uh, if you do have any other questions, if you're listening or watching, and uh, get in touch with us at joel at shogazorba.com.au is my email. And thank you very much to our producer. Eric, who always puts together everything behind the cameras for us. And uh, thank you again, Stu. It's yeah. been, been a fun episode. Thanks, Joel. No worries. And, uh, of course, One, one Way. One Way.